Hello everyone. Celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. Read Matthew 19.12 In the Old Testament to be a eunuch was a thing of shame and they were considered to be cursed by God. If you weren't able to be fruitful and multiply then you were excluded from normal society. In most countries of Africa, that's still the case today. Those who are celibate for the sake of the kingdom have chosen to abstain from sexual relations. Some priests say that they had no choice, but they did, because they knew before they were ordained that priesthood and celibacy were part of the one packet. That was before we started admitting married Anglican clergy into the Catholic Church, which of course is a completely different scenario. However, Christ's words make a special place for celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus commands people who leave father and mother and wife and family and land for the sake of the gospel. They will be repaid in this life and in the next. So the roots of celibacy are in the gospel itself. St. Paul has also told us that you cannot combine spiritual fatherhood of the family of God with fatherhood of the natural family. The two simply don't mix. Celibacy is not an arbitrary rule which the church imposed on its clergy for no reason. However, for practical purposes, the alienation of church property at the time may have added some weight to the church's decision. In the theology of the body, we are given a refreshing perspective on the celibate vocation. The last Pope says that celibacy does not devalue sexual union, but on the contrary, it points to its ultimate fulfillment. The married and celibate vocations are intertwined. Is, if marriage is devalued, as it is today, so also is celibacy. We see where the so-called sexual revolution brought on a dramatic rise in divorce and a corresponding rapid decline in vocations to the priesthood, the brotherhood and the sisterhood. <coughs> In Matthew 22, we see where the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection tried to catch Jesus out with a woman who married seven men. They put the question, at the resurrection at the end of time, whose husband would she be? But Jesus shows them up for their lack of scriptural knowledge and he says that at the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Marriage in this life is meant to foreshadow heaven where the marriage of Christ and his church will be seen in its full glory. The greatest desire of the human heart, whether married or celibate, is to live in everlasting communion with God himself. Will earthly spouses know one another in heaven? Of course they will. In fact, everyone taking part in the heavenly wedding feast will be in the most intimate possible communion with everybody else. That is why it is important to get your affairs in order before you die and not to be at loggerheads with anyone, especially your wife or husband or parish community if you are a priest. God's plan for all eternity is nuptial. It is indeed to marry us. Hosea 2.19 Jesus left his father in heaven and eventually left the home of his mother on earth so that he could lay down his life out of love for his spouse, the church, which includes you and me. Symbolically speaking, husbands and wives lay down their lives for each other in marriage. Jesus says, Anyone who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. That applies to the priesthood as well as marriage. The nuptial meaning of marriage happens in time, 
but he points the way to the heavenly nuptials. Celibacy for celibacy's sake is useless unless, unless it points beyond itself. Now, there are some celibates who use it for their own egotistical ends. So also, married people may fail to truly understand the self-giving nature of marriage. The separation of sex from procreation has dealt a very heavy blow to the self-giving in marriage which we're talking about. Also, priests who surround themselves with material things and worldly comforts have also lost the plot regarding the meaning of the priesthood. Both the celibate and married vocations are called to express nuptial love through their bodies. Every man is called to be both a husband and a father. Every woman is called to be both a wife and mother, either through marriage or the celibate vocation. For a celibate man, his bride is the church. For a celibate woman, her husband is Christ. Is celibacy the higher calling of the two, like St. Paul says? The superiority of continence does not mean denigrated marriage. It does not mean that we are leaning towards the Manichaean heresy which viewed sex and the body as tainted. Celibacy is only higher in the sense that heaven is higher than earth. But even though it might be a heavenly vocation, it obviously involves sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom. The priest or religious sacrifices sex for the sake of the kingdom, so that instead of his love being focused on one person, it can be shared among the multitudes. Since we live in a sex-saturated Western world, celibacy also gives a credible witness to the value of chastity and self-control. That doesn't mean that many men in the priesthood haven't failed in their vows and gone off the rails. Some shallow people say that it is a good reason for priests to get married and get rid of celibacy. It's like saying that since so many marriages end in divorce, we should get rid of marriage. That's how stupid it is. The man or woman who chooses to forego genital sexual expression for the sake of the kingdom demonstrates that he or she is not bound by an uncontrollable libido. The grace of Christ is there for those who find the keeping of the celibacy or married vows difficult. But celibacy itself is a gift to the Church. Without it, the Catholic priesthood would definitely be devalued and the priesthood would just be seen then as a job rather than a vocation. Consecrated celibacy are not meant to condemn themselves to a life of isolation from the opposite sex. That is not the will of Christ. Think of some of the great Catholic saints who were celibate. Francis and Clare, Vincent and Louise, John of the Cross and Therese of Avila, Francis de Sales and Jane de Chantel. Without each other, the above people would not have achieved half as much. The Pope says that in these situations, some people have suspicious minds and believe there is monkey business going on. Since bondage to lust is all they know in their own hearts, they project that onto everyone else. Some of these masters of suspicion contend that celibacy is to blame for the various sexual problems of the clergy we've heard about recently. They are the same people who say celibacy is unnatural. Yes, there are celibates and married people who fail, 
but God offers special graces to both groups to resist the temptation and see their vocations as gifts from God. Would priests be better off married? That is what a convert married priest with children has to say. And this is what he says. Remember married men are not perfect. Married clergymen are workaholics. Married clergymen are immature. Married clergymen have affairs. Married clergymen have brain problems. Married clergymen have same-sex attraction and abuse children. When a clergy marriage breaks down, it's usually disastrous and scandalous, and the hurt and pain ripple right through the whole parish. I don't mean to paint a horrible picture of married clergy, but reminding people that it is not quite as happy and wonderful as they seem to think. Believe me, there will be equal, if not greater problems, if we opt for a married clergy. And now that piece is from a married clergyman. Celibacy does not cause sexual disorder, sin does. And getting married does not cure sexual disorder, Christ does. Did not someone say that sin is a good twisted in the wrong direction? It could be said that the sexual confusion of our world is simply the human desire for heaven gone berserk. Those who are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven should shine as a bright witness to the fact that our ultimate fulfillment rests in God. St. Augustine says, you have created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Thank you all for listening, and God bless you all. Catholic Teaching on Contraception for Pope Paul VI, marital relations are much more than a union of two people. They constitute a union of the loving couple with a loving God, in which the two persons create a new person materially, while God completes the creation by adding the soul to that person. For this reason, Paul VI teaches in the first sentence of Humanae Vitae, that the transmission of human life is a most serious role in which married people cooperate, collaborate freely and responsibly with God the Creator. Humanae Vitae is clear about the intrinsic connection between the unitive and procreative meaning of the sexual act. It teaches there is an unbreakable connection between the unitive meaning and the procreative meaning of the conjugal act, and both are inherent in the conjugal act. This connection was established by God and cannot be broken by man through his own volition. Humana Vitae explains that the Church condemns artificial contraception since it violates both the procreative and unitive meanings of the human sexual act. To engage in an act of sexual intercourse using artificial contraception is to engage in an act that has the potential for creating new life and tremendous emotional bonds between male and female whilst at the same time undercutting this potential. The sexual activity in which husband and wife are intimately and chastely united with one another, through which human life is transmitted, is, as the recent council recalled, noble and worthy. 
It does not moreover cease to be legitimate even when for reasons independent of their will it is foreseen to be infertile. The fact is, as experience shows, that the new life is not the result of each and every act of sexual intercourse. God has wisely ordered laws of nature and the incidence of fertility in such a way that successive births are already naturally spaced through the inherent operation of these laws written in our bodies. If, therefore, there are well-rounded reasons for spacing births arising from the physical or psychological condition of husband and wife, or from external circumstances, the Church teaches that married people may then take advantage of the natural cycles imminent in the reproductive system and engage in marital intercourse only during those times that are infertile, thus controlling birth in a way which does not in the least offend the moral principles which we have already explained. Neither the Church nor her doctrine is inconsistent when she considers it lawful for married people to take advantage of the infertile period, but condemns as always unlawful the use of means which directly prevent conception, even when the reasons given for the latter praxis may appear to be upright and serious. In reality, these two cases are completely different. In the former, the married couple rightly use a facility provided them by nature, but in the latter, they obstruct the natural development of the generative process. It cannot be denied that in each case, the married couple, for acceptable reasons, are both perfectly clear in their intention to avoid children and wish to make sure that none will result. But it is equally true that it is exclusively in the former case that husband and wife are ready to abstain from intercourse during the fertile period when for reasonable motive the birth of another child is not desirable. And when the infertile period recurs they use their married intimacy to express their natural love and safeguard their fidelity towards one another. In doing this, they certainly give proof of a true and authentic love. It calls on priests to spell out clearly and completely the Church's teaching on marriage in this area, which I believe it hasn't done since this doctrine was promulgated way back in 68. In fact, we've kept very silent about it. Janet Smith writes that the last many decades have revealed that the Church has been very wise in its continual affirmation of this teaching, for we have begun to see that contraception leads to many vicious wrongs in society. It facilitates the sexual revolution, which leads to much unwanted pregnancy and abortion. It has made women much more open to sexual exploitation than men. In fact, Humanivite predicted a general lowering of morality should contraception become widely available. And I think it is manifest that ours is a period of very low morality, much of it in the sexual realm. Western society has undergone a rapid transformation in terms of sexual behaviour and few would argue that it is for the better. Contraception has greatly facilitated this downward trend. Dr. Janet Smith continues, Sex is for babies and for bonding. If people are not ready for babies or bonding, they ought not to be engaging in acts of sexual intercourse. 
The modern age tends to treat babies as burdens and not as gifts. We speak about accidental pregnancies as if getting pregnant were li like getting hit by a bus. Some terrible accident has happened to us. But the truth is that if a pregnancy results from an act of lovemaking, this means that something has gone right, not a, that something has gone wrong. Babies are treated as an unwelcome intrusion on the sexual act. Women now take a pill to thwart their fertility, as if fertility were a disease against which we need a cure. Contraception, artificial contraception, treats the woman's body as if it were something wrong with it. The use of contraception suggests that God made a mistake in the way he designed the body and that we must correct his error. It does not fail to mention that many forms of contraception are abortifacient. Contraception then enters a note of tremendous negation into the act of lovemaking, but it should be a most wonderful act of affirmation. This is conveyed by making a total gift of oneself to the other. The true, the use of contraception calls the vows which the couple made to each other and to God on their wedding day into question because the spouse's total gift of themselves to each other is withheld. And now we have a teaching by St. John Paul II in his Apostolic Letter Familiaris Consortio. This is what he says. Precisely because the love of husband and wife is a unique participation in the mystery of life and the love of God himself, the Church knows that she has received the special mission of guarding and protecting the lofty dignity of marriage and upholding the most serious responsibility of the couple in the transmission of human life. People give all sorts of reasons why families should be limited through contraception. Some are guided by purely materialistic considerations. Others believe that the world is overcrowded, which is a total lie. The ultimate reasons, the Pope said, for these mentalities is the absence of God in people's hearts which fuels this anti-life mentality. Pope Paul VI affirmed that the teaching of on the two meanings of the conjugal act, the unitive and procreative will by God, are not allowed to be broken by man on his own initiative. When these two meanings are separated, man and woman act in a purely subjective way and without reference to the divine plan, manipulate and degrade human sexuality and with it themselves and their married partner by altering its value of total self-giving. It is a falsification of the inner truth of conjugal love. The choice of the natural rhythms when controlling a family involves accepting the cycle of the person, that is, the woman, and thereby accepting dialogue, reciprocal respect, shared responsibility, and self-control. Knowledge of NFP, which is Natural Family Planning, must be made accessible to all married people and also to young adults before entering into marriage through clear instruction and education given by married couples, doctors and experts in this area. Now thank you all for listening and God bless you all.
Hello everyone. This talk is on married priests. In this article, Father Dwight Longenecker gives his take on the issue of married Catholic priests. He was an Anglican cleric, but is now a married Catholic priest with children looking after his own parish. He said, Today I had a conversation with somebody which has been repeated numerous times. Father, you are so good with the children and you understand marriage firsthand. Don't you think the church should allow priests to marry? The church continues to uphold the fine and ancient tradition of priestly lifelong celibacy. It is the discipline of the Western Church that clerics are celibate, but it is a discipline which could be changed. St. Paul hints at this in 1 Corinthians 7. But should it be changed, bishops were obliged to be celibate from the 4th century onwards and priests from the 11th century. So celibacy has a long tradition but in today's day and age, should the church allow its priests to marry if they so wish? A lot of people think so. Some say that the mandatory vow of celibacy is one of the greatest deterrents to increased vocations. But I would say that if mandatory celibacy were dropped, vocations wouldn't dramatically improve. It would also mean that a priest would have to juggle with two jobs, making him far less effective as a priest on the one hand and less available to his family on the other. The crisis in vocations has little to do with celibacy and far more to do with the secularization of our culture. L less children per family is also a major contributory factor Father Dwight goes on, that's the married clergyman. Believing that married priests are the answer, assume that they are mature, happily married men. I'm afraid marriage does not automatically make a man mature, self-giving and happy. In my experience of married clergy in both the evangelical churches and the Anglican church, it is not the magic bullet. Remember, married men are not perfect. Married clergymen are alcoholics. Married clergymen are immature. Married clergymen have affairs. Married clergymen have drink problems. Married clergymen struggle with same-sex attraction and abuse children. When a clergy marriage breaks down, it is usually disastrous and scandalous and the hurt and pain ripple right through the whole church. I don't mean to paint a horrible picture of married clergy, but reminding people that it is not all quite as happy and wonderful as they seem to think. So having married clergy will not necessarily solve the vocation crisis, nor will it necessarily improve the priestly ministry, and it certainly won't be a solution to any personal problems the priest may have. And don't forget, with having married priests, there is also be quite a lot of divorced priests. That in itself would undermine the Catholic priesthood as a whole. Father Dwight, this married clergyman with children, continues, There are other practical problems. Catholics say that they want married clergy, but do they want to pay for them? I can get by because I work two jobs, parish priest and school chaplain. In addition to this, I speak and write, and my wife works. Not all married priests and their families can do this. I think the only movement there may be on this in the future is that the church may decide to ordain some older married deacons. But the faithful should think it through carefully. Yes, 
celibacy may not be suitable for every priest, but believe me, there will be equal, if not greater, problems if we have a married Catholic clergy. Now, thank you all for listening, and God bless you all.